The first question I want to ask you politics, fashion, sexuality, religion, film, film Nigeria, sports, sports. Music. music, the course of my career. Just ask. Right. It's ask for me, and I am for me, and you are asking me. Or oh, who's asking who? Well, it doesn't matter because I've got in the house today with me um, somebody I call my tribesman. Not in an ethnic manner, mm -hmm. but in a mind manner. My guest today is British Nigerian international designer, Mr. Emmy Collins. Hey guys, how are you guys doing? I'm glad to be here. Hi, Emmy! Should I misbehave? No, 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 no. I no, should no. be good. No, be you good. want me to be good? When we go where we go, we do it the way we do it. Okay, you are so. never, <laughs> you are never, you are on front terrible to the Nigerian fashion industry. But we're going to come back to all of that. So this is the question, the audience question I've got from Mr. Emmy Collins. It says, in an industry that thrives on continual creation and inspiration, how do you keep fresh, motivated, and mostly creating and creative? On a personal level, I think the best way to always keep creating, I mean, keep yourself uh, as creative as possible because the, the competition is very, very strong. Yeah. You know, and if you want to be noticed, if you want to keep creating, I think the first thing you ask yourself is, what have other people done? Yeah. Because you need to know what is out there so that you know what not to do. Yeah. Because that's the way I work. I need to know what is out there and then find a way to go away from those things and do my own thing. So yeah. for, for me, it's, it is always about making sure that everything you do is original. Yeah. You know, make sure you keep reinventing yourself. Ask yourself, okay, I've done this last year or last season. I mean, how far can I go with who? Or can I go with this same thing or can I stay, go totally away from this thing and, and create something else? It's all about imagination. Right. You know, it's all about imagination. I mean, or try to not to believe in what you've done or last season or the previous season, you know, because that is gone. You have to move further. You have to always keep it fresh, keep it different and try to be yourself. Don't copy what other people are doing. You know, the only way you want to know what other people is doing is to make sure you're not doing the same thing. They might be good. They might be lovely. You love them, okay? But that's where it stops, okay? You have to move on and do your own thing, you know? Because the, the minute you try to be like other people, how many people can you be like? Can I ask you my own questions? Oh, please do. Can I start? Can I start? No, no, please. Okay, so me. this is going to be on the back of that question. Okay. So there's what they call fast fashion. Okay. So there's quick turn turnover of all sorts of things in all fashion sorts of now. Yeah. I hate it. I know, I do as well. And that's why I'm going to ask. Because you know what I see is that A, everybody's wearing the same shirt. Yeah. Pardon the yeah. French. Yeah. It's overpriced. I know. There are really stupid looking dresses and stuff, mostly for women, that are ridiculously overpriced. overpriced, overpriced. And it's the same thing. I've lost interest in clothing. It's, 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 and what more? Why are they all so anxious and boxy? It's like the woman's body is no it longer... It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, so yeah, it's all yeah, square yeah. and boxy. Even to the top designers are actually falling over themselves to copy each other. Yeah. And, and it is quite disappointing to me because people, designers that, I've, that I used to respect, okay, I go to their website or I see what they've done, I'm just like, wait a minute, the other designers done this. And you have all that resources. You have, you have bottomless pit of money. You have, I mean, you, you, you've got interns, you've got aides, you've got people who can work for you. All you have to do is just keep on churning out the good stuff. Some, sometimes I'm jealous of them. I've read of designers quitting. It is isn't true. Because they say the pressure is too much. The genuine designers, the genuine designers, okay, the creative ones, okay, don't have interest anymore. Because you look out there. You know, you find out that the, um, um, uh, 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 the corporate bodies that are actually propping up these designers, they don't care about what you create. They care about the bottom line. So if, you, if, you, if you're really that person who want to create, you want to do stuff, 
And then there's this money guy who's telling you, listen, I just want the money. So find out what is actually selling, what is selling millions and millions. That's what I want. Okay, okay. You know, be, because because you see some of the of the designers that are actually working for big brands, some of them don't have the independence that, that they need to create. Yeah. Because yeah. there's always some guy in there, the accountant or some money guy who's always banging on his head. Get the money, go where the money is. Um, and the only way to go where the money is is to find out what other people are doing that are making the money. Okay? So, 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 so personally, I think the world of fashion is in trouble because there are people who cover magazines these days, you know, who cover the Vogue, whatever, that back in the days, in, in the 80s, they would never, they would never have come close to even the 52nd page. But these people are covering the magazines now. And that was, that, that, that was a certain um, a photographer who, who refused to photograph one of these people because she was like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna photograph her. There's nothing fashionable about her. I'm a fashion photographer. So are you talking about some celebs that they then put on cover? I mean, it's not just in, it's all over the world. Celebs all over the world. Is Kim Kardashian fashion? Kim Kardashian, how no? Well, she's covering the magazines. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's about the money. It's about selling them. It's about selling. And that's why I see myself, I'm an independent guy. For me, I didn't, I didn't come into this industry just for the money. It has, I mean, it, I'm, I'm happy with what it has given me so far. It has built me a house, which I think, I mean, I'm not rich or whatever, but I have it is mine. Yeah. I built it with my sweat. If there's no penny or mortgage on it. Yes, you know, but but the thing is that if I could have gone the other way, I could have made ten times more than that. Yeah. Because I have some people who look at me, they're like, dude, you should be making a lot more money than you're making. Yeah. But for me, it's about the passion because this is what I've been doing since I was this high. I've been designing my clothes since I was this high from Nigeria. So I'm looking at this from two perspectives. I'm looking at it from the perspective of the consumer and also the designers. So the designers are create as creatives. I can see how much this is a problem for them because what you're talking about, the corporatization of the world. And the interesting thing is I can see that the ownership of many fashion brands are also involved in ownership of media brands. Yeah, of course. Of so course. they determine, they determine it's, it's everything, it's about basically. But surprisingly, there would, there's someone like... Um, um, uh, Michelle Alessandro of uh, Gucci or whatever, whatever. I'm so surprised that they've given him the freedom because he's creating. Yeah. I must say he's creating. Mm -hmm. He's coming up with new stuff. I mean, I mean, new stuff that are, that are very edgy, very original, and it's like fusion of elegance and quirkiness or whatever. And that's what I'm on about. Yeah. That, that's what I've been about. I've been on about for the past 10, 15 years. So just him alone, single-handedly has... Yes, resuscitated. It has brought me back to, to life because yes. things I did 12, 13 years ago that people are going to look like, huh? He's doing them. Yeah, I saw the new Gucci aesthetics. And when I look at it, I'm like, that's Emmy. I, I, that's... Did, I did those like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. So, so it's, it's like he's made these made more acceptable. Yeah, but it's still the same thing. They're ridiculously overpriced. <laughs> How much of it? How much of the dresses, the clothing that ends up on the rack how much of it is close to what it should really be in value? There is an industry markup strategy, right? For some people, it's 2.5. For some people, it's 300%, right? Now, um, for them, you know, I mean, these guys, they spend a lot of money on adverts. So literally for the consumer, you have to realize that these guys are not charity organizations. So they mark up the cost of advertisement. The cost of, 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 the, of the government is probably just about 20%. 80% is on the models, on advertising, on, on premises, and that's what you're paying for. But for the resourceful consumers, they go out there, they take their time, they don't buy something because it's branded. They buy something because they like the quality. A number of designers have spoken out, international designers have spoken out really about the pressure 
that this pressure to sell, 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 and yeah. therefore to just churn out materials churn affects their creativity and season, skill in the, the year. Seasons after season. season. Are there too many seasons? Or, 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 because you have this pressure to can keep on churning. Don't, don't, don't worry about the quality. You're just churn keep, it out. You know, just bring them out. Bring the money. You know. So it's, it's all about what the chief executive is taking out, what this one is taking so out. So is it the people, the consumers demanding more? Or is it the corporate forcing ideas down people's On throats? The, the corporate greed is everywhere. Yeah. It's in fashion as well. Mm. Okay. Now, what it is is that for every guy, the, the, the business executive in, in any of the big brands, okay, his job is to make money, tons of money, more money. And when he goes to bed, that's what he thinks about. How do we get the money? And he knows that there are buyers out there with tons of money who are actually bored. He wants to get as much of, of yeah. that money as possible. So he could wake up tomorrow and then he goes to designer and want more of this and more of this. So basically for him, it's about the money. It's not about the consumer. It is um, um, uh, the people behind the brand, not the designer. Does it help when consumers understand this? Because I would tie it, for example, to a lot of issues around women. So body issues, you know, esteem issues and all of that. Because the more you, the more the corporate feels that they need to make money, the more they push ideas of what you need to be, to be beautiful, to be respected, to be liked. And the more people want to buy those things. It only works on the people that don't have authentic styles. People with authentic stars. You but can, most people don't have yeah, authentic egg, style egg, egg, because we don't egg, teach people to do that, to egg, express egg, themselves. Egg, exactly. So, so the moment people start believing that they that they can actually, you know, wear something from ten years ago, they can actually wear it in, or, or, or today, you know, as long as the quality is still good, because people are made to understand that. If something is 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 off season, you there don't have to wear it yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's why right now, if you my new website, everything, but most of the collections are called them seasonless. I don't ah, do seasons anymore. Yeah. My motto has always been never in vogue, never out of vogue. Yeah, I know that. Right from the onset, I've never done anything that is in vogue. I've always liked that. Never in vogue. Never out, never of, out vogue. of vogue. Yes, from me. Yeah. You know, so even some stuff that, that I, I made like 10, 15 years ago, I still wear them today. Yeah. Because they were never in vogue. Even your t-shirts. I still, I still wear them today. Yeah. You know, some, you know so, 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 so it's, it's about people educating themselves, knowing that there is a trick out there to get money off them. So What's the role of bloggers? What do you think of bloggers? They are playing a part in pushing for or fashion forward, the fast fashion or whatever. They're playing a part. But um, I don't know if I'm a very good fan of them, okay? Uh, especially those that just woke up and started blogging, who knew next to nothing about fashion. If someone has come from a fashion background and decides to blog, that is understandable, okay? There is passion behind it. There is experience behind it. But what I cannot understand is people that never in their lives, okay, been fashionable. They, they've never even loved fashion. But suddenly they, would, suddenly they discovered, okay, I could probably get a few followers on Instagram when I start doing this, or people are probably going to view me a certain way when I start doing this. And then suddenly that person becomes a blog. Those are the ones I can understand because I'm just like, this is not your world. You can't teach people what you don't know. Well, but know. there are people who don't have fashion backgrounds, but they are fashionable. Maybe they have great individual styles. And so they start talking about it and people start following them. Isn't that what fashion bloggers were meant to be, really? That, that's what I'm saying. That, that is what they're meant to be. If, if, if a fashion blogger is someone who understands fashion, the workings of for fashion. So does it have to be by training? No. We're tra we're tra I'm not trained. You know? I'm self-trained, yeah. okay, and with the experience that I've Sorry, gathered yeah. over the years, and that's why I'm not structured. Yeah, I'm just him. I'm just him. him, him that's him a come. very important thing you said. That's why I'm not structured because no. oftentimes it seems also that you can tell the aesthetics of those who are trained a certain way. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because if you've gone through certain training with millions of people, they structure your mind. Mm -hmm. Even your designs sometimes tend to be. I like, 
if one can actually look at them very closely. I find oftentimes that there are lots of kids these days, I call them cool kids, who do fashion, but they don't know fashion. Mm -hmm. they, and they are not, so there's a lot of how to be. You know, so everybody follows it. They decide, oh, it's minimalist. Everybody's running minimalist. Everybody. Is this everybody's running? If, like, if, if, if it's boxed, um, everybody, a jacket, yes, everybody's, everybody's going you know, through so that like direction. That. You so know? the kid, for example, who's out there, who's, who just has this, who has interest, who has... How does he fit in? How does he or she fit in into that world? It still comes down to mentality, if you have a strong mentality. Because growing up in Nigeria, I was one of the people, even in the 90s, you know, living in Amsterdam, I was one of the people who never wear baggies. Because, I mean, I'm a skinny guy, you know, I find myself in a, in a baggy. I'm just like a little thing running around <laughs> it. You know, I tried it a few times. It didn't work for me. Everybody around me were, were you know, were wearing their baggies, uh, dropping it up the way to their knee, knees or whatever. I tried it a few times. It didn't work for me. And I moved on, you know. So, 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 so you have to have that mental strength to resist. Yeah. Not to let peer pressure get to you. And to understand that the majority is not always right. Is that why you then became a blogger? You, I mean, you didn't become a blogger. You started a blog. You started what became Nigeria's most feared <laughs> style and fashion blog. I mean, you did more than style and fashion. You also went into politics. Why did you go back to Nigeria? I mean, you'd already had, you had a in, successful in, career in the in, UK. In, in, You've done a lot of work in Amsterdam. See, today I still ask myself that question. I had a showroom in one of the best locations in London on short is Great Eastern Street, right next to Hoxton Hotel. How good does it get? I just up and sold it. No, if to today, to be honest, I can answer you that. I can answer that, that question, genuinely honest. I can answer that question. I mean, at some point, I'm just like, Someone probably shot you in the, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably that, that old, old man in your village, you know, brought you back to Nigeria too remote or whatever, you know? That, that's it, you know? But that happens a lot, that, you know, because no I see generations of people, it's always happening. So there's always a wave of movement back to Nigeria and then a movement back to Nigeria. Back. It, it, it seems to be going, yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what is that about? You know, what is really, because some people argue that it's nostalgia, that after you've been out of the nostalgia, country for a long time. Nostalgia was part of it because I, I'm, uh, oh, I'm going to get emotional. I lost my mom and my, my, my closest brother within a space of six months. And there were some issues going on in my family at that point. So it was like, it was like, I think it kind of got too much for me. I was like, you know, I just had to go. I found myself in a situation where I was hanging out at Brandy's or cool crowd or whatever, you know. But at the same time, I was going through things that were happening in Nigeria, the non-existence non of electricity, the non motorable ways, everything negative that was going on in Nigeria. I was living, you know, within this environment these things were going on you know everybody was pretending as if it wasn't going on no one was actually dealing with it so uh, people were all too vain it, it was about this and they expected me to to, to do oh it's just talk about fashion but they were many other things that are more important and as far as i'm concerned you know it's, you see when, when people use use, <laughs> use the phrase oh, my fashion is life or whatever some people take that very literally. But for me, no, fashion is not life. Fashion is fashion. There are rich life. There are more things, better things in life. People are dying. People are hungry. And I'm just like, no one is talking about these things. But these things that happen, we just sweep them under the rug. I need to talk about them. So it, it was like I just woke up and one day I just, just said to myself, no one is doing this. You have to do it. So you started that blog that became, I mean, it was, it was feared, but also it was respected. It was. Because I had friends who were calling me and saying, you, I know you are Amy Collins' friends. Tell him we love him. We can't, we can't. I mean, people, some of the people who, they're like, we can't say this thing, but thank, tell him, it's thank it. you for saying them. Because you went across from music, the whole creative arts industry and politics. And I feel you, that thing about politics, because it always does my head in, you know, it's the deliberate, the deliberate papering over our reality, you know, as though it isn't the reality that determines everything else. 
you know, so we don't see it, we don't know it. Yeah. You know, we all dress nice, yeah, yeah. and then all that's the, fine. Everybody, I mean, it was like every, everybody was playing the ostrich. Yeah. And I'm just like, come on, this, this thing is happening. And they're like, yeah, we know it's happening, but you're not allowed to talk about it. I'm just like, why? Why? I'm the, I'm the Do you think it's a fair? Because I've always wondered about Nigeria. Because recently I just signed up politics completely. I've done, I still, I've, I like go and look at my body of work, you know, and talk to me where we are ready to do something. All I want to hear is what are we going to do about it? If we're not going to do anything, I don't, I think that Nigerians either are not going to talk about it. And when they talk about it, it's really about, there's a curious enjoyment, a curious macabre enjoyment of describing the details of the dysfunction, almost like bear apologist, but not really wanting to do anything about and it. The people that get, that are engaged in what you just described now, are actually those that are actually supposed to be proffering solutions. Yeah. These are the people on Facebook, on social media, just describing what is going on and being so happy describing it. And at the end of the day, no solution Nada, next solution is put forward. These are our master's degree holders, these are our PhD, and that's why I don't respect education anymore. Because education is about experience. It's about experience. For me, that is what education. And mark my word today, in the next five years, the formal education is probably not going to be as important as it is right now. And that's why even in the EU, lawyers are going to apprenticeship. Yeah. Wall Street, people are going to apprenticeship because they know there is nothing as important as someone being on ground, watching that thing done every day, practical. So you came back. It was almost like you did the blog, you stared the hornet's net, and you were like, you know what, done. I lost friends, I'm, I must tell you, very close friends. Very close friends, people I love, people who love me. But the thing is, is, is like, I'm not one who believe, you know, and I'm not one to believe that to love people means you have to lie to them. I, I was like this voice in the wilderness. Everybody around me sees stuff and they don't want to say it. And when you say it, they, 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 the worst bit of it is that they don't say to you, oh, you're wrong. No, they say you're right, but don't say it. I'm just like, I'm, you know, it was like I was going to a culture shock in my own country. Will you go back? No, it won't happen again. It won't happen. I love Nigeria and I still miss it every day. Even though, even the drama that I run away from, I still miss the drama because sometimes it could be like, okay, you know, it could, it could be actually fun to watch sometimes. But I don't see myself. I'm, I'm not actually at some point, you know, maybe I, I, I could literally move to Ghana and visit Nigeria from Ghana. So, what is the deal breaker for you in Nigeria? Because you, it doesn't seem to be just the structural issues. What is the deal breaker? There was this lady, I mean, who, um, who freed some slaves. And she has a quote out there. I don't know if... He, and the quote was, was something that goes like, you know, she could have freed more people if they knew they were slaves. If the poor Nigerian, the average Joe, okay, if they could understand the terrain, if they could understand that there is a game being played against them, against them, okay, if they would understand that and quit fighting people that are there to fight for them, quit fighting against their own interests, how do you let someone convince you to go against your own interest? And this happens over and over and over in Nigeria. So the big guy, the rich guy, keeps on winning and the poor man keeps on losing. That is Nigerian story. So the moment the average Nigerian, they start to understand a bit of what is going on, you know, that for me would be enough for me to go back. And to, to be honest, the situation in the structural issue, if, I mean, if people are surviving, I can survive, I've always been a survivor. Yeah, but that's the real deal, Briga. That the, the mentality. So there's something called African fashion. Okay. I'm not quite sure what it is. Do you know what African fashion is? <laughs> you describe it to me because I don't know. You know, because I hear it all the time. They say, oh, you know, you, you should wear something more African. And I'm like, uh, what do you mean? Certainly what is always shown to me as, oh, you should be more African is a lot of color. 
a lot of patterns, large patterns. That's one. And, and I'm always saying, for example, that if I go back to, because I don't even know what you mean by the whole of Africa, there are many, many cultures in Africa, that if I go back to Yoruba land, for example, that I understand huh? that the Ashoke, for example, we're, we're Wovun, not, they are not they were not flamboyant, like in your they are face not in your face, whatever. they're actually yeah, quite yeah. subtle and beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you went to do the tie and dye they do in, in uh, Abel Kuta, for the, example, the, the in Indigo. Come in, you know, in light purple, in light, gray, you know, all of that. So, so this thing is actually somebody else's perception imagination, imagination. of what yeah, Africa yeah, is yeah, meant yeah, to yeah, be. Yeah. And we have actually then rewritten it as our own way. What should I'm, Africa be doing in terms of design and fashion and the industry what, itself? What, what, and is it even right to say Africa? So Africa has to key in. Okay, and see what they can bring into the world, not what they can keep for themselves and call it African fashion. You have to find a way to merge the African, whatever you call African fashion, with whatever fashion and make it one. What is the problem with the Nigerian fashion industry? Problem with Nigerian fashion industry, to start with, there is a saying that goes, you can't have a fashion industry without a fashion manufacturing industry. Someone has to make the, the, the clothes. And you don't have any person making the clothes in Nigeria. The machinists are not there. The artisans are not there. The craftsmanship is not there. The mentality to do um, a proper quality control is not there because what they call politics is this little, what the world called politics is big. So there is a whole gulf between what Nigeria calls quality and what is accepted as quality. So for them to do that, they have to bridge that gap. It has to start with mentality first. So does this come back to governance, really, at the end of the day? Because you're talking Honest, structural issues now. Uh, no, 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 no. Education, no. production, distribution, no, no, training. No, no. no. It's, 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 it's a lot easier to, to blame structure. And when you're talking about structure, it probably comes down, back down to government or whatever, right? because it's the government that put the structure. What and, I mean so, is that, because when you talk about machinists, you talk about artisans. Yes. To be, because I know, for example, my friend Remy, who you remember, oh, one, of her, so. one, of, one of her artisans, who was actually really talented, eventually gave it up and he started selling pampas oh, at the border. More money. Because there was more, more money. money. More money. Or what? And he was trained traditionally. And that would have, the, the people who trained him gave up what they were doing because it's, they couldn't make a success of it because there wasn't an industry. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't sell, they couldn't distribute. So all of these things are interwoven. Yep. And if you can't move goods from one point to the other, if you don't have power consistently to be able to produce these goods, if you do not have the, you know, there are so many things that it's not even, governance is a lose, it's a lose it's, world. It's, it's a lose world. It's just okay. all of those. And, and one thing is structure. Another thing is mindset. Yeah. It's for you to, it's for, because the funny thing is that sometimes I'm just like, okay, you buy your whatever, your brand in the UK or wherever, do you ever compare the quality of what you have in Nigeria and what does do you do? But do the people understand all the processes that delivers that quality? Because I found that we are very fascinated with the material, the end results, the, the so end we are consumers. Result. But we're not as fascinated with all the pro processes. Do you know I was the first person that ever, ever, um, because when, when, when I when as, at the time, you know, I had this uh, brief uh, stay in Nigeria. It wasn't even brief. It was almost two, two, two and a half years there. At that point, there was... Are no you going on about just two and a half years <laughs> of suffering? I mean... <laughs> no, at, at, at that point, there was nothing like fashion workshop. Yeah, you also did that. I was the one who, who, you know, who launched the first free fashion workshop. It was free. Yeah. If, if, even though at that point I was hemorrhaging money because I was building a house, yeah. but I still find a little to put in that. Yeah, so what you you're know, saying, because product. this is it. This is consume, This is the product. And this had all the processes to yeah. get to the product. But at the beginning part of this product process is the abstract thought. You know, the abstract ideas. Yeah, yeah. They are, and the abstract thoughts and ideas come from a mindset. Is what it is, yeah. So the beginning and the heart of it for you mm -hmm. is the mindset because the mindset will then create the abstract so, thoughts. And, and then the abstract thoughts will then 
create all the processes which will bring you to the product. To, 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 to the product. I'm going to talk now about men and women's fashion. Because I know, I mean, from the beginning when I met you, I just loved everything. I just loved your aesthetics. I just loved it. It was very much the kind of things I like because it's very individual, very oh, strong, thank you, thank but also you. really refined. Yeah, you know, I don't like that dichotomy between... Mm -hmm. Men's wear and, uh, you know, and, and I also yeah. like to mix things yeah, up. So yeah. you made all this, everything you made, I just love them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then I, I started going on about, I mean, you've got to make women's wear, you've got to make yeah. women's wear. I know you are looking towards women's wear now, uh -huh. but why is there that dichotomy in the first instance? Why do you foresee a time when there will be a closer bridge of men's wear and women's wear? You know, without people actually then ascribing labels onto you? Because if you like to wear, what I see now, they've decided that because there's all this conversation about feminism, so we have decided that for us to be more strongly female to is to become more male. More and I'm like, actually, no. no. You know, the yeah. more the more female you put, yes, yes the, the more feminine you want to be. It's in the so head. I, it's in the head, it's, it's in the, in the, the head. soul, it's in the heart. Yeah, I do not no, want to wear no, boxy, no, 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 you know, no, 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 no. shapeless clothing. You know, and inter interestingly, I see men, or a friend of mine drew my attention to it, that a lot of men, particularly younger black men, are wearing clothes that actually are more sexual. So if you look at all those drop um, drop trackies they wear, yeah, they're yeah, tighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then... Around the crotch, he grabs. Yeah. And then, of course, the body is also tight. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, there's a lot of... The men are becoming more there's, feminized I mean, I mean, and the women it's, it's, are becoming more mask so-called. I mean, these are all labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is um, uh, androgyny, you know, like... Um, uh, men. For, for me, I, I think... Um, I've never really cared because you see the, this, they, this fabric, the supplier, you know, because this is actually from uh, uh, when I buy my fabrics, I don't just go if, even from for for the for the menswear, I I don't go strictly to the men because when if you, if you go to shows, you know, I mean this, I mean they will tell you menswear, womenswear. Mm -hmm. I go everywhere. Okay. This was this fabric was actually bought from the women's women wear supplier. Good, you know, and it was like, oh, 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 what are you gonna make with that? I'm just like, you watch and see, and that brings me to freedom of mindset, you know. So whether it would translate to a time where that bridge, that that cut on me is going to is going to be gotten rid of, I don't know. But one thing I can say is that over the years. It it, 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 it it has gotten closer. Instead of talking in terms of absolutes, mm. you know, so it's not like, oh, men and women should now wear trousers or men should now wear skirts. I mean, everybody, in my own mind, I think people should do what they want. Just wear whatever what, they... what, However, what you are what you are introducing, which is really interesting, is you blur the lines from every level. No, no. So in terms of there's no fabric that nobody should be able to no, wear. No, Men you, should be able to wear silk. And no color. Easily in pants. No color should and be... And no color. And if, even like I found out that recently I'm, I'm beginning to, to work with a lot of black, a lot of grays. Because for me, you know, I say, I, I say give me your black, give me your gray. I put color to it. Okay, so for me, color doesn't stop me from anything. If 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 I feel the, the fabric, if I drape it around my cheek, because sometimes I drape fabrics on my cheek, I mean, this feeling that I get from fabric, I'm just like, yeah, you, you're coming. You come here. So for me, it's not about color. It's not about anything. It's about what you eventually make out of. All the things we have ascribed to different gender or group, mm -hmm. we unascribe it because who says this color is for men and this color is for women? Who says this fabric is for men and this one? So you, that's what you start with. You unascribe. And, and it, the thing is that people, do you know it takes mental strength? It takes confidence for you to ask certain questions. And that's why I've been asking questions since I was this little. If I'm supposed to be this designer, how come I'm supposed to go along with what someone came up with 40, 50 years ago and I still call myself a designer? It, What's my own impact? It, you know, it hasn't made, it, has, it didn't make any sense to me. It makes this, this much sense to me. People need to st start having that confidence. And when you wear certain things, don't be conscious of it. Just wear and go. Like, wash your hair and go. Mm. Don't, so you don't end up with a dress wearing you? No. Just wear and go. You're not conscious. Don't be conscious of it. Just wear and go. Mm. Because when you're conscious of it, you're like, oh. 
it's, it, you're like, oh, is, is it looking at my trouser or whatever? Does she approve? Does she approve? No. Clothes and appearance has become, well, it always has been, but now it's become even more political. And I'll say this, for example, you know, there's, so we've talked about Africa fashion. There's also on another side, the so-called idea of black fashion. Wow. Another one as well. <laughs> You know, so there's a way, apparently there's a way that you're supposed to, that what, what's much more black, much more, you know, much more culturally, you know, strong. For example, I mean, I wear my hair in natural states because okay. it's an aesthetic decision. I like it. Yeah. You know, I mean, if awesome. I wake up tomorrow, I would decide I'm going to cut it and, you know, straighten it. It's That's not a problem, it yeah. you know, and I, you know, and so on and so forth. But how do you keep your, how do you infuse your cultural identity or leanings or understanding into 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 fashion and there i say into a more universal idea of fashion it still comes down to what i was saying about africa um uh, trying to infuse what they call the african fashion try to fuse it with the uh, western fashion we are only thinking about ourselves and we just this bit of the market. So you are thinking we have to become more universal. We have to become more universal. See in our we, ambition. In, in our ambition. As opposed to someone starting a fashion label, even here in London, and you're thinking about, about just the blacks. We live in London. What is our percentage? Five, ten? In London? How do you want to put yourself in such a little box? And that's why I never do anything at African Fashion Week. I don't have anything against them. If, so, if someone feels, you know, your brand needs such exposure or whatever, I would love to. I would literally pay to be part of it. Okay? But I've looked at it, I'm just like, no, this thing does not work for me. Because we need to dumb ourselves. We need to dumb, dumb ourselves down. Just to make sure other African designers could meet the standard. There is a standard, London Fashion Week. Yeah. Okay? If you can't meet it, then do your own thing. The African Fashion Week. If you want to do it, fair enough. But make sure the standard doesn't shy away from everything else. What, 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 is, what, is, what is acceptable. Yeah. The standard has to be there. Yeah. So what you're saying is that for any group that is excluded... What you want to do is create your own platforms Make with sure a high standard too, so that actually it becomes universal. Don't, so they come to you they, on that platform too. They, they come to your platform. It's just, and, and, and believe me, Africa for what it is, you know, Africa is not actually as poor as we think Africa is. It's all, it's all about us believing in each other and bringing our resources together and knowing what, where the competition is. And making making sure that we that we work ourselves up to that because you need to ask yourself who are my competition, what who is my competition, and you try to either beat that person or try to be as good as that person or try to even work close to be as good as that person, and with time you could get there or even or even further. I have a last question for you, and it's about your daughter. What advice do you give your daughter about style? and about womanhood and about dignity. How old is she now? My daughter is 15 now. Yeah. She was 15 in April, and, um, and I'm not with her mom anymore. The first thing I'm teaching my daughter is to be independent, okay? She has her own money. I put money on her bank account. Her mom puts money on her bank account to know what, how to work with money. She, she buys whatever she, she wants to buy, but her mom controls the bank account, make sure she's not buying the wrong thing. Basically, it's getting her to get used to money, that's what we're doing now. And then trying to give her an independent mind. Because I always say, say to my daughter, you should never, ever depend on any man. Because that's a problem. This was part of the problem that, that I saw in Nigeria that really, I mean, it really made my, my skin crawl. Okay? We've come to this uh, um, um, level where we believe all our happiness is based upon a, upon a man. And these are the men that I know. I know myself. I know I'm full of crap. Thank I, you for saying that. <laughs> you know, I know I'm full of crap. I know my friends are full of crap. And then when you're going to think your happiness depends on me, you have a problem. 
You have a major leg problem. Your happiness depends on you. Women are raised and valued mm -hmm. in relation to how others relate to them. And the number one other is a man. You know, and that's so flawed for any human mm -hmm. being. At the end of the day, you are not, even though there are many things that make up who you are, before you were your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, or your husband's wife, or your daughter's mother, you, you were you. 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 And that person is what matters the most. It matters the and most. it is not your, the actions or reactions of your mother, your husband, your children, and all of that mm -hmm. that must determine your life. I think that's important to teach women yeah, one way or the other. And you and I share something in common, aside from other things, a strong mother. Because one of the things my mother used to say, and she used to say it's in Yoruba. So up until now, I hear it at the back of my mind. And what she was saying is, no matter how hard it gets, you are the one who will still control your enterprise and therefore your life. And so if it means that you are going to go and be selling pepper in the market, you do, do it. And because you know at the end going. of the day, you know where you're going. You it's your going. own thing. That's where you're it's going. It's a means to an end. It's a means to an end. It's a means to an end. So, so you, you have to always have ambition. As a Nigerian living here in the UK and uh, having been around in Nigeria, you know the, the terrain, you've been on television and everything, you know. How do you think that we can move away from this ethnic, you know, um, um, ethnic politics that we're experiencing in Nigeria right now? Because in as much as we've been talking about fashion, okay, I think that is the greatest um, um, disaster that we have in Nigeria. The moment people start seeing themselves as Nigerians, not Igbo, not Yoruba, not, not Ethic, I think that is the only way that we can prosper. So I'm always uh, uh, curious as to how we can move away from that and, and deal with tangible issues. Okay, I'll start from the top and I'll say that I don't define myself as a Nigerian living in the UK. I've chosen that I'm a cosmic being okay. and I live on the earth and so, I will go where I want to go. Nobody enough. is going to tell me where so I can be okay. because we are first and foremost this energy force, this intelligence force, so I can go where I want. And the other hand, because I have been to many places, I have also started to look at things, not just from a Nigerian perspective. That's why I say to you, I understand when you say sometimes we want to turn it into a little hole and say that's all we are. I begin to look at things more universally. And I'll tell you what I mean, that this thing you're talking about, ethnicity, is global right now. Everywhere around the world, people are tunneling in into national groups, you know, just small cultural groups. And there's an underlining reason. First, we have to admit that we are human beings and we are the same. And human beings tend to be behave similarly under certain circumstances. The way we behave is very much related to external factors. And so the external factors that are common across the world right now is a collapse or a near collapse of, 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 a, of a way of doing the world. And I'll explain. I don't want to use terms like capitalism because everybody starts running into a corner. But look at it that everywhere in the world, through the ages, whenever people start to feel that resources is limiting or dwindling, they start looking at the other. So... In Nigeria, in those days, when we started having problems, they say, oh, it's the Ghanaians. Chase the Ghanaians out. And, and we kick them out. We kick them out. In South Africa, it's the Zimbabweans. Kick the Zimbabweans out. In the UK, it's the immigrants. Kick the immigrants out. In America, even an immigrant country, you know. So it's a human thing that when people are afraid, based on a sense that resources are becoming limit limited, that people are not getting as much as they hope to get, they will become fearful. And when they become fearful, they will attack anything and anybody they perceive to be the other. So the rule is the same in Nigeria as it is for everywhere else. There are two things that need to happen. The first thing is that we have to actually genuinely look at how we have organized the world in such a way that people are not getting reward for work anymore. There is a problem. A lot of it was exacerbated from 2008 or 2007 where we had the collapse 
you know what I and mean? The with the collapse, with the financial collapse and the collapse of the way things work and the loss of jobs, people started to balkanize mm. across the world. The same thing in Nigeria. Every time Nigeria hits a spot where our resources become even more problematic, they dig further into those differences. Nigeria doesn't have a state for the people of Nigeria. It has a state for the elite of Nigeria. There's a, there's a historical reason why that is so. And you are right, I think, in that idea of the day the common person in Nigeria turns around and looks, that actually, come on, this is not happening anymore. You guys, it's not about me, Yoruba, or you, Igbo. It's actually about a the class rich and against us. You yeah. know that sort of thing. It is the same here. Look at America, the same thing. It is the, 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 the economy collapsed. It collapsed because of the activity of a certain class group of people. Yes. And now it's, no, but now they've turned against one another. It's the same everywhere in the world. We have to relook, we have to reshape, and it's everybody concerned. So the economists, you know, the philosophers, the thinkers, they are going to come, we are going to need to come together and reshape our world. Where we are right now is very interesting to me as a person who has decided to pull back to look at us beyond even just now. Where, you know, when a system goes on for a long time, it's working or not working, and then it gets to a point where it's like when you pour water, when you pour milk into coffee, that point where everything is dabaru, where everything is everything entropy, yes, that's right where we are now. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, it's going to need to settle. For that settlement to happen, though, we have to shape the narrative. And, and that's what we are not doing. How do we share the narrative? And how I can only talk, for example, about my own part, which is the media. That thing you said earlier, my own gift, if I could give something to Nigerians, and if I give it to Nigerians, because there are so many black people and African people in Nigeria, you will be giving it to a larger part of Africa too, is the ability for the average person to see themselves as fully functional human beings and to know what to demand and what to accept. You know, so that for me is the sort of media I'd love to be able to do. It's like what you said in fashion, where it's no longer just about virality, but actually what needs to be out there. So yes, that for me is what will shape it. If we, if we don't do it, something dis disastrous will happen because that's how nature works. Yeah. If you don't do the right thing, if you don't pull it back, you will get a disaster, you will get a tragedy. And that will center your mind. And that is not just for Nigeria. I think it's global. Whether it's Nigeria, United States of America, Britain, Netherlands, or anywhere else, the real battle is against who controls the resources and the ordinary people. And how much of that is shared more evenly. No That's the real battle. However, what you have now said, which is important, is that for some countries, there is a larger understanding amongst the mass of the people of what their role and their rights are. And their worth. And their worth. So the reason why that isn't true for Nigeria is because you must remember that Nigerians... There isn't a real idea of what a state is mm. for Nigeria. So that's yeah. the real issue yeah, there. So yeah. that has never been taken care of. Because you see here, because the nations develop more organically, and it's not all of it that's organic, because of course, Scotland was, called, was taken over. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, the world, yeah. you know, not Ireland, all that. So that, whatever, that was, yeah, yeah. But the fact of it is that because there is a more organic system of growth of nation, there has also been a more organic way of restructuring nature. I always say to people that you must remember that these are countries that beheaded leaders. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. beheaded people on the streets. Not just leaders, you know, so, 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 and anybody. So there's been a history of understanding what people will not take. And they've gone through all that. And they fought the wars. They and, fought and so I'm not asking anybody to go and fight war in Nigeria and all of that. But to understand that there are things... There's a reason why we are the way we are. And what we need to do actually is to have, because that's what happened even here in other parts of the world. You might fight all the war you want to fight, but at some point, there will be the reasonable people who will say, gentlemen, let's let us be reasonable. Let's have a Let us do what needs to be negotiate. done. And those are the guidance of the society. What Nigeria lacks is guardianship we don't have of the society. Always think about what could have been. Because we have one heck of a blessed country. You have to see yourself beyond as a cosmic being, once again. And you know what that means? It means that whatever you do to the world that moves the world forward, you are doing it for Nigeria. You're doing it for Nigeria. Yeah. So you don't, you don't give up on Nigeria in that way. Yeah.
Yeah, you, know. you don't feel bad about it because you're not going to be able to exercise it from your soul. You're no, fighting no, no, against no, no, yourself. No. No, yeah, you are. Because for me, it's, it's, it's a love-hate relationship. Like I'm looking at this shirt yeah. now and if I see this shirt, as I should say it, yeah. on some of the most powerful people in the world and some of the most ordinary people in the world, I know it's an Emmy, Emmy, yeah, yeah. Emmy shirt. Yeah, yeah. And I know this shirt was made by a man who came out of Anambra in Nigeria. <laughs> so our ambition, I'm always saying it now, that our ambition as Africans, as Nigerians or whatever, has to become excessive so that that excess will spread it around the world. So what I'm interested in, in really is helping people feel yeah, what you feel. Because once you feel what is, what is missing in here, you feel whole from the inside. So you don't need the prop. You don't need the prop. You it's know? all you don't need all the power, you know. And this is not just for Nigeria. It's all, if you go on the train in London, work hours, people are reading. Most of what they are reading is motivational books, how to get more successful. Because we have a little crisis on our hand mm -hmm. globally. I'll just say this to you, Amy. Mm -hmm. I see you. I see you. I know, I know. I know you see me. Right? I see you. Yeah, I all right. Know, I, know. I see you. So all right, but well, that's our conversation mm -hmm. for today. Um, next week, I'll have someone else. It's Ask for Me. Send me more questions or your comments or your thoughts, and I appreciate them. See you again. Bye now. Ta -da. See you guys later. <laughs>